Hello, beautiful people. How are you today? How are you going? Like, how are you really going? How's life going? Most importantly, how is your dog? Are they happy? If you have not seen this face before, then hi, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Liz and I quite often sit in this chair and talk about mostly true crime, but also conspiracy theories, weird moments in history, unsolved mysteries, all of that kind of thing. So if you're sitting there like, heck yeah, I freaking love that stuff, then hit subscribe and we can be best friends forever if you want. And if you don't want, because we're best friends now. And if you have seen this face before, then hello. How are you, bestie? Thank you so much for voluntarily choosing to hang out with me again. I mean, it's probably not your most sound life decision that you've ever made, but I'm I'm on board. I'm glad you're here. I think we can make this work. Welcome to my first multi-parter. Are you guys nervous? Wait, no, you guys shouldn't be nervous. I'm nervous. Wait, no. I shouldn't have said that. You guys get to chill out, grab your snacks, grab your coffee, grab your wine, and just settle in because we're about to go on a journey together. A journey into the crazy, disturbing, wacky world of Nexium. If you have not heard of Nexium, then, oh child, strap yourself in because we are going on a wild ride. Like, keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just, I'm just kidding, but you get the idea. You get it. Here to morally and emotionally support us on this journey, I of course have my supervisor slash production manager slash real star of the show, editing Liz. Let's switch to Lily Cam. There she is, all settled in, all ready to talk some crazy cult shit. Before we go ahead, I just want to put in a disclaimer here. We're going to be talking about some pretty intense things in this series, including but not limited to suicide, high control groups, emotional, physical and sexual abuse, including that of minors and children. So I just want to let you know to proceed with caution if you think any of these topics might be triggering to you. With that said and out of the way, let's begin. I mean, if you're, if you're ready. Are you ready? Am I ready? I don't know. I guess we will find out as we go along. Let's go. Nexium was created in 1998 by its founders, Keith Raniere and Nancy Salzman. It was a cult that managed for 20 years to disguise itself as a multi-level marketing company, otherwise known as an MLM. I mean, there are some people that will say all MLMs are cults, but that's a different discussion to have on a different day. Not today. Before it was taken down last year, the group's website claimed that over 16,000 people in the US, Canada, and Mexico had taken Nexium courses. Nexium was pitched to potential followers as a company that would help you unlock your full potential, a place where you could learn the life skills that you were inherently missing, you know, like the missing puzzle pieces, and that you could then use these skills and this knowledge to achieve literally anything you wanted to with your life. But in reality, behind this glossy facade that most of its students and followers were familiar with, Nexium had this dark underbelly. And this underbelly was exposed when in September of last year, Keith Raniere and others from the group were arrested and found guilty of multiple criminal charges, including racketeering, forced labor, and sex trafficking. It was also revealed that there was this secret subgroup in Nexium called DOS that was made up of sex slaves that were being branded with Keith's initials. Crazy. Like, how did this happen? How? There is a lot of information to go through in this case, and I feel like I've been studying Nexium for, like, years instead of weeks. And I want to be as thorough as I can possibly be so I can offload all this crazy information that I learned to you guys. So I think we're going to split this up into three videos. Three is a good number, right? Three is a charm. That's what they say. And for us to get the very best understanding that we possibly can of Nexium, I feel like it's important to start off today with Keith Raniere. 
um, his childhood, his upbringing, what he got up to in his early adulthood and what he was up to before he started Nexium. So Keith Raniere was born on the 26th of August, 1960 in Brooklyn, New York. He was the only child to his parents, James Raniere, who was an advertising executive, and Vera Oshipko. Oshipko. I'm butchering that. Let's call her Vera. Uh, She was a ballroom dancing instructor with a heart condition. When Keith was five, he moved to Southern New York, and this was where he grew up. According to legends spread by his followers, Keith was speaking in full sentences by the age of one, and not just in English, no, no, but also French and German. He was reading by age two, understood quantum physics by age four, and had mastered college level math before he ever even entered high school. And I'm just going to point out right here that all of these claims are totally unverified and unproven. But when Keith was eight years old, he took part in an intelligence test. And the results from this test showed that he was a brilliant child. When his parents sat him down and told him, you know, just how gifted he was, how intelligent he was. His dad, James, said that it was like this switch went off for Keith. Overnight, it was like Keith became in his own eyes, like Jesus Christ himself. He began to act like he was better than those around him, like he was superior to everyone, almost like a deity or a god. It was the same year in 1968 that Keith's parents got divorced. So the little family unit of three that Keith had known his entire life just fell apart, disintegrated. He ended up living with his mother, Vera, in Suffern after the divorce. I feel like you have to be American to say Suffern correctly. Like I feel like it's Suffern, Suffern, New York. In school, Keith's superiority complex obviously extended out over his classmates. He was extremely competitive and always out to prove his brilliance and better than-ness over those around him. He could also be very manipulative, especially with his elders and teachers. One woman that was in his class in Green Meadow Rudolf Steiner School said that when they were about 10, she accidentally shared some sensitive information about her sister in front of Keith. Later, apparently after mulling it over, Keith approached her saying, you know what? We both know that your sister and your parents would not be very happy if they knew what I knew. It's like I'm holding this little bottle of poison over your head that I could drop at any time. Keith would also call her house to speak with her and just repeat the phrase little bottles over and over again taunting her. Another woman named Jessica Plout says that Keith constantly belittled and bullied her in school. She remembers one occasion where Keith was using a microscope and she asked if she could have a look as well and he agreed but just as she was about to look into the aperture Keith snatched the slide out. When Jessica complained that she couldn't see anything Keith said it was because she was too stupid. When Keith was 13, Vera, his mother's heart condition was getting worse and she had to undergo open heart surgery. Being an only child and with his father gone, Keith was confronted with the very real possibility of facing the world alone, which yes, would have been scary, but don't feel bad for him, okay? I know where this series is going and trust me, you do not want to be feeling bad for Keith Ranieri right now. Vera survived, but But Keith has said in the years following the surgery, she suffered from very serious alcoholism. But Keith's dad, James, has vehemently denied this claim, saying that Vera may have drank more than she should have, but she wasn't an alcoholic. Nevertheless, Keith became quite the nocturnal creature in this period of his life, staying up most of the night to be his mother's carer. He seemed to view Vera in equal parts love and contempt treating her as kind of a damsel in distress. They say hindsight is 2020, and it's very easy to look now and see how this unique mother-son relationship where the caretaker and care receiver roles were reversed and how this would have had a profound impact on Keith 
and how he related with women. Vera herself was witness to this and was concerned enough to call his father, James, in a panic, saying that dozens of girls had been coming to the house to see Keith and she had overheard him telling each and every one of them the exact same thing. I love you. You are the special one. You are important. You are the only thing in my life. Sadly, Vera died at the age of 47 in 1978. Keith graduated that same year from Rockland Country Day School, two months shy of his 18th birthday, before moving on to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, or RPI, where he claims to have obtained record high grades while earning triple degrees in computer science, maths, and biology. In reality, though, Keith barely passed or even failed a lot of the upper level maths and science classes he claimed to have like smashed. So he earned a GPA of 2.26 when he graduated in 1982. For my fellow Aussies out there that are like, what the heck is a GPA? A GPA is basically a score out of four. So a GPA of 2.26 means that Keith barely even got a C grade. In the early 1980s, Keith became involved in Amway, briefly working with them and taking a bunch of courses. And if you've not heard of Amway, they're like one of the original OG MLMs and they're like this huge worldwide company. They've been sued and investigated a bunch of times for potentially being a pyramid scheme. But despite all that, they're still around to this day. They're huge. Amway, massive. Around this time as well, Keith developed obsessions with Scientology and neuro-linguistic programming, which is something we will delve into later in this video. In 1984, Keith met a 15-year-old girl named Gina Melita, who was involved in a theater group that they were both performing in, run by RPI. Hi guys, it's Editing Liz here. I'm so sorry to interrupt. It's so nice to meet you. Uh, I just needed to point out that filming Liz here totally forgot to mention that Keith was 24 years old at the time that he met Gina Melita. So I just wanted to slide that in here. Sorry for the interruption again. Okay, back to the video. Keith would take Gina to arcades and play games like Pac-Man and a video game named Vanguard. And he bragged to Gina saying, you know, I'm a judo champion and I'm a genius. And Gina was just like, wow, he's so cool. You know, like she was a 15 year old girl. She was easily impressed and naive. The two entered into a four month long relationship where Keith committed statutory rape and took Gina's virginity. Despite Gina only being 135 pounds or 60 kilos for you Aussies in the back, Keith hounded Gina to lose weight and not tell her mother about the relationship. When Gina eventually had enough and said, no, I want to end this relationship, Keith agreed, but said that they should still continue having sex. Instead, luckily for her, Gina decided to cut Keith completely out of her life, but sadly not before she introduced him to her friend, Gina Hutchinson. Gina Hutchinson was also 15 years old when her and Keith started having sex. Gina's sister Heidi says she was home for Christmas from college in 1984 when she walked into Gina's bedroom and found Keith climbing in through the window. When Heidi confronted Keith saying, you know, what the hell are you doing with my 15 year old sister? Keith told her that she wouldn't understand. He said that Gina's soul was much older than her biological age and that she was actually a Buddhist goddess that was destined to be with him. I mean, how can you argue with that, right? In 1990, certain that he could improve on Amway's way of doing things or just realizing that to make money in a pyramid scheme, you had to be at the top of the pyramid, Keith made his own MLM called Consumers Byline Incorporated or CBI. CBI offered discounted goods and services to members who paid a yearly membership of $220 or $400 USD by today's standard. In true MLM fashion, members could earn commission by selling memberships to others, and the company itself was really very successful. In 1992, at its peak, CBI had 250,000 members and made $35 million in one year. 
And in the midst of the success, Keith had already accumulated a inner circle of followers that were walking around calling him the smartest man in the world. How? How did this happen? See, as well as the test he took when he was eight that showed that he was gifted, Keith had taken a second IQ test a couple of years before starting CBI, and this test had shown that Keith had a IQ of 186. To give a point of reference here, an IQ above 140 is considered genius level. Albert Einstein never took an IQ test in his life, but his IQ is estimated to be around the 160 mark. So Keith, with an IQ of 186, was officially smarter than Einstein. This test, however, that Keith had taken was a take-home, unsupervised, untimed test that has received plenty of criticism from the scientific community. But nonetheless, Keith was listed in the 1989 Australian edition of the Guinness World Records as one of the three smartest people alive. He even took it a step further later on and claimed he had an IQ of 240. Okay, Keith. In the early stages of CBI, a 12-year-old girl was brought into the CBI offices by her mother. Her mother worked for the company as a saleswoman, and she was recently divorced and struggling with the long hours at CBI and with her newly solo role of raising her two daughters on her own. Keith observed this and offered to tutor the young girl in Latin and algebra and offered that the mother jumped at. So grateful that Keith was kind enough to give her daughter such a great opportunity being tutored by the smartest man in the world. Keith, who was nearly 30 at this point, took on a kind of mentor role with this girl, spending tons of time with her, speaking with her, urging her to tell him about her life, giving her gifts like a necklace with a heart on it and hiring her to walk his girlfriend's dog. And then one day he hugged her and he told this 12 year old girl that she hugged like a child, that he could show her how to hug like adults do, pelvis to pelvis. And then he took her virginity. Keith continued to have sex with this girl about 60 times over the next several months in his townhouse, in the offices, in a broom closet, and in an elevator. When she filed a police report a few years later in 1993, police requested that she wear a wire and confront Keith, getting him to incriminate himself. You know, just a 14-year-old underage girl going up against the 33-year-old man that raped her repeatedly when she was 12. She refused, doubting that Keith would fall for that, and eventually signed a waiver saying that, yes, Keith had had sex with her when she was 12, but she was not going to press charges. And Keith got away with it. Scot free. Yeah. It wasn't long after this that a woman named Tony Natalia's husband told her that the world's smartest man was coming to Rochester where they lived and that they just had to go hear him speak. Tony was a little bit skeptical and hesitant at first, but she agreed to come along. Reason being, Tony had always been insecure about being a high school dropout and she couldn't help but be curious about what a man with a 240 IQ had to say. As they sat in the audience in a small rundown auditorium at a holiday in near the airport, listening to Keith pitch to potential CBI members, Tony's husband turned to her and whispered, he looks like a geek. And Tony couldn't help but agree. Keith was surprisingly short. He had a mullet-esque bowl cut and rosy round cheeks. He was soft-spoken and came across as very unassuming, even shy. But obviously, whatever he had to say that day impressed the couple because they signed up for CBI and quickly became two of Rochester's top sellers. Tony next saw Keith when she travelled to Albany to see the company's headquarters firsthand. When she got there, she heard one of the women working there saying, she's here, is she family? To which Keith replied, yes, she's family. Creepy. Ugh, super creepy. 
Keith took an instant interest in Tony, and when he noticed that she smelled of cigarettes, he asked her if she wanted to quit smoking. And all Tony could think was that this man with a 240 IQ and an incredibly busy business wanted to take time out of his day to help little old her quit smoking. So Tony of course said yes, and Keith took her to a private room to speak with her. And all Tony remembers from this encounter is Keith listening intently while she spoke about what made her nervous and what made her anxious. And as she spoke, Keith touched pressure points on her knuckles and her hands. Keith told Tony to touch these pressure points every time Tony felt like smoking and like a goddamn miracle, she never smoked again. When she walked out of this room almost in a trance, someone in the hallway asked her what had taken so long. Why was she in that room with Keith for so long? And Tony was confused saying, I was only in that room for 15 minutes. What are you talking about? And she was completely floored when that person told her, no, you've been in that room with Keith for two and a half hours. When Tony returned to Rochester, Keith started calling her and the two would spend hours and hours on the phone. Keith was a really great listener and within a few months he had learned all of Tony's secrets, including her insecurities about her education, the fact that she had been molested as a child and that her and her husband hadn't been intimate in years. At one point, Tony called him out saying, why is the world's smartest men messing around with an MLM? Why aren't you doing something important? Why aren't you curing cancer? Why aren't you changing the world? And Keith's response was, I am going to change the world. Don't you want to come along? Within a year of meeting Keith, Tony moved with her son to Clifton Park, a suburb just outside of Albany. Keith had gotten her a job at a skincare company that partnered with CBI and had convinced her that her husband was sleeping with the nanny and that she should leave him. They started a relationship that Keith told Tony no one could know about. And when she asked him why, Keith turned all of the secrets that Tony had told him into a weapon against her and told her that it was because she didn't have a formal education and that people would think that she had gotten the job because of him. CBI shut down in 1993. There were claims that they hadn't been paying commission checks to members. There were 20 states investigating them. And there had been a lawsuit filed in the state of New York alleging that they were a pyramid scheme. Keith, rather than admitting any wrongdoing on his part, said that the government was after him and so was Walmart because they were taking away their business. Keith and Tony started another business called National Health Network that was another MLM that sold supplements and vitamins. By this point, Keith and Tony's relationship was already incredibly toxic. They had bought a house together, but it was only in Tony's name. And Tony claims that Keith raped her during their relationship countless times. And while he did this, he would say that it hurt him more than it hurt her, that he did it so she could share in his energy. Keith also had Tony keep the body of her recently deceased dog in her freezer and forced her to look at it every day to help her deal with the death. By 1998, Tony had sent her son to live with his dad, something she says that Keith manipulated her into doing. And it wasn't long after this that Nancy Salzman, the future president of Nexium, entered the picture. Nancy was a nurse, a trained hypnotherapist, and a self-proclaimed psychotherapist. She was also the number two expert in the world in neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP. Now, NLP was very popular in the human potential movement in the 1970s. It was created in California by Richard Bandler and Rick Grinder, who believed it was possible to identify the patterns of thoughts and behaviors of successful individuals and teach them to others. NLP has been claimed to cure everything from anxiety to the common cold to phobias to HIV and AIDS. And what NLP basically involves is the practitioner using a very specific technique of speaking with their 
client or subject or patient. I actually have no idea what term to use here, but basically speaking with them in a very specific way. And while doing this, observing that person's verbal and nonverbal cues, for instance, their body language or their eye movement. The practitioner uses their tone and their words to elicit a particular response from the person they're treating. And they'll employ tactics such as mirroring that person's body language to make the person subconsciously feel that the practitioner is empathetic towards them. And the goal is to make that person feel a specific way, the way the practitioner wants them to feel, ideally without that person knowing that that's what's happened. It's very convoluted. While it's not exactly hypnotherapy, it definitely has its similarities. And over the years, NLP has been discredited as a very potentially harmful pseudoscience due to the very real manipulative possibilities for the practitioner over their client patient, subject, whatever, you get the idea. Now, Tony was receiving therapy from Nancy Salzman for a little while before she eventually introduced Nancy to Keith. And Nancy and Keith pretty much bonded instantly over their interest in hypnotherapy and NLP. The self-improvement industry was absolutely booming at this time. And it wasn't long before Keith and Nancy started speaking about starting their own business together, where the original plan was to go into big corporations and peddle their self-help courses. While Keith and Nancy were ironing out the details in their business model and constructing their self-help courses, Tony became their guinea pig. She was forced to go over her childhood trauma in excruciating detail again and again and again for hours at a time, all under the guise of it being to help her and to help her finally let go and unlock her real potential. In 1998, Keith and Nancy launched their company, Executive Success Programs, or ESP. And I know there are a lot of acronyms to keep track of in this video. I'm sorry. Apparently the smartest man in the world really likes his acronyms. ESP was pitched as an organization that aimed to advance human potential and ethics through personal and professional development programs, corporate trainings, and a comprehensive training program. Keith called it the change humanity needed to alter the course of history. Potential clients were told that if they took an ESP course, they could obtain the tools they needed to conquer whatever it was standing between them and their success. That rather than vague goals and things to work on, ESP courses would give you a step-by-step -step guide, a scientific math-based approach created by the world's smartest man to create a fuller, richer you. And you could have all of this for the low, low price of $3,000 per person for a five-day course. What a steal. So, okay, I wanted to give you guys like a really clear picture of what ESP was and what a beginner's class would look like to a newcomer because I feel like this will give us a very clear idea of the very foundations of Nexium and the brainwashing and grooming that took place from the very first second that someone stepped foot through those doors into the self-improvement class that they thought they had signed up for. So let's play a game of pretend. Let's put on our imagination caps, okay? You've signed up for an ESP course. You've spent that $3,000. You've taken that plunge. Here's a rough idea of what you could expect. Firstly, when you come to the ESP office, you would be guided to the front desk and asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And if you were like, uh, why? You're told that the teaching method and the curriculum is just so powerful and so innovative that there is a very real risk that the technology can be stolen and misused by other self-help groups and therapists. So you're like, okay, whatever. You sign the non-disclosure agreement and then you go to the classroom 
at the door, there is hanging on the wall a picture of a man named Keith Ranieri, who everyone refers to as Vanguard. And you're instructed to say a heartfelt thank you to the picture of this man for blessing you with his divine knowledge. You sit down and wait for the class to start and you notice that the staff members are wearing silly looking silk sashes around their neck that seem to indicate their rank in the company. And if a senior SPN, which is what members of the company are referred to as, if they walk into the room, you're expected to stand to show respect. There's also this weird secret handshake the staff members have going on where the senior SPN's hand is on top and the lower ranked SPN's hand is on the bottom. Now all of this is super weird and super off-putting but you can't help but to feel the magnetic charged energy in the room. All the SPN's are excited and engaging and super successful seeming and they're all smiling at you like they have this grand secret to life that they're just dying to share with you. I mean, celebrities like Jennifer Aniston, Rosario Dawson, Jared Butler have done these ESP courses, so they have to be legit. And nothing normal you've tried in the past has worked, so you just think, fuck it. Let's just give it a go. The class begins with you watching a cringingly 80s-esque video of a woman named Nancy Salzman, who welcomes you to ESP, tells you about her meeting Keith Raniere and him changing her life, and telling you what they want to help you achieve. Watching Nancy Salzman gives you a strange feeling like... More is being said in the video than just the words she's speaking. You might then be split off into different groups. And if you've come with a family member or a friend, staff specifically make sure to separate you from them. And you're told that this is just standard procedure to make sure you're not distracted by each other and to make sure you both get as much as possible out of the course. The classes are intense and long, sometimes lasting up to 13 hours a day. So you're often overwhelmed and exhausted, but you're told that this is a good thing, that you should be uncomfortable, that most personal growth happens outside of your comfort zone. From day one, you are required to be very open and very vulnerable, filling out questionnaires that ask, what is your biggest regret in life? Who do you most need to make amends with and why? What do you most detest about yourself? And then there's a new lingo to learn as well. You're taught that the fears and inhibitions that hold you back from all that you could be are called limiting beliefs or disintegrations, and that your goal should be to work through these and become integrated. You're told that you should aim to be an at-cause person because this means that however you're feeling, you are the cause. You are a victim only if you truly desire to be a victim. But if you are at cause, you can feel however you want to feel, be it happiness, joy, love at any time, no matter what's going on around you. The staff then begin talking about RI or rational inquiry. RI is a technology that has been created by Vanguard, a process that has been painstakingly designed to produce tangible, measurable results, a process that can achieve in minutes what takes therapy years to do. And when you finally make it to the last day after hours and hours and hours of intensive coursework, there's the finale where RI is harnessed in the form of an EM or an exploration of meaning. For your EM, you are called to the front of the class to sit opposite an EM tech or a coach and in front of everyone there, you're asked to name a specific issue that you are wishing to conquer, be it anxiety while driving on the highway, a fear of heights, a loathing of auditions, a fear of men, a fear of intimacy, whatever it may be. In the EM, the coach asks you a series of probing and invasive questions that you've been told will help you identify the fear or limiting belief that is behind that issue. And in most EMs, they lead back to a memory 
that you have as a child. And if this is the case, all the EM tech or the coach needs to do is fill in the missing logic that you didn't have as a child. During the EM, you might become emotional. You might have a flashback to your childhood. You might feel like your brain is being rewired, literally like your brain is being hacked. The ideal outcome of an EM is for you to experience an integration for that issue to no longer have a captive hold on you. Oprah would call it a aha moment. If you do in fact have a breakthrough, it's most likely accompanied by a high, by a sense of euphoria, because thanks to ESP, you now have one less issue holding you back from the person you were meant to be. And when you're still soaring on that high, you're the most emotionally, mentally, physically drained you've ever been. And an SBN approaches you and congratulates you on on your massive breakthrough. And they say there's another course that they personally feel would really benefit you. They tell you it's only a few thousand dollars. And if you can't afford that, ESP will do you the favor of letting you work for them to pay off the debt. Of course, one of the charges against Keith Raniere and multiple others involved in Nexium some 20 years later was forced labor. But these impressionable, elated, exhausted people didn't know that. So so that's how so many people got sucked into working themselves to the bone for free, working off their debt to Nexium. Back to Tony Natali, who was growing increasingly concerned and disturbed by the goings on at ESP. She left Keith in 1999, telling Forbes later that he had brainwashed her, telling her the most bizarre things among which that their future child would alter the course of history. Tony had to file for bankruptcy after National Health Network went bust. Her mother even had to file for bankruptcy after helping her with her legal costs. So, Tony thought that things couldn't possibly get any worse, but she was incredibly wrong. The last thing Keith said to Tony before she left was, I will see you either dead or in jail. And apparently he was hell bent on keeping that promise because Tony and her family were harassed by Keith and his associates for decades to come. They called her house at all hours of the day and night. They cancelled her health insurance. They called her credit card companies. They would come to her house and steal her mail. And they called her son's school and cancelled his school enrollment. Keith would also personally send Tony letters, which ranged in tone from begging her to come back to a not so subtle death map which plotted her demise if she continued on the path she was on. All of this of course was a way for Keith to say to Tony, I'm still in charge. I still own you. And on top of all of this harassment, Keith also filed a barrage of lawsuits against Tony. He also contested her bankruptcy multiple times. He even pressed criminal charges, the last of which I could find was in 2018, almost 20 years after she had left. Things got that bad that Tony was diagnosed with PTSD. She said in an interview that she had accepted this was what her life was now. Constant harassment, constant court battles, until Keith was either dead or in jail. The most frustrating and disturbing part about Tony's story is that throughout all of this, throughout all of her struggles, she tried to speak with the media and authorities trying to blow the whistle on Keith Raniere and ESP, but no one wanted to listen. It may seem like Tony's experience with Keith had to have been the worst of the worst, but in reality, she was one of the lucky ones because she got away with her life. In the next videos of this series, we're going to talk about the women that crossed Keith's path that weren't so fortunate. Also, the formation of Nexium and its smaller groups, including DOS, the secret subgroup that enslaved women using blackmail and collateral under the guise of empowering them. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, just remember to hit like. Um, Lily, of course, would like to come say bye. You going to come say bye to your friends? Hello. Say hi. Are you hungry? <laughs> Woo. <laughs>
Don't beat up my plants. Thank you so much for hanging out with me as usual. I really appreciate it. Um, I will bring out the next video of this series, hopefully later in the week. So I'm really excited for that. I hope you guys are too. Uh, I think that's everything. I think I'm done rambling. I got to go feed my dog. Have a great week. I will see you next time. Bye.